when I first began, Herbert had a studio and he said, why don't you join us? I said, I don't know how to teach. And he said, you know how to act? Share what you have learned. Well, that was to me such a wonderful way of approaching it. What I learned as a teacher is to select for the individual actor each time he works, two or three things he can work on that will take him ahead a little bit. In other words, you can tell an actor everything and they don't know where to begin. They leave in confusion, so I haven't helped them at all. So to really selectively go for what will further their individual problems and solve them for them is what's taken me a lifetime to learn. Watch your fellow colleagues working. Don't be judgmental. Don't say, oh, I like his work, or I like, don't like her work, or you know, do your own. It teaches you nothing. If you really watch and identify with it, if something is convincing, ask yourself why. What are they doing that, that is allowing for that? If you don't believe it, say, that's wrong, that's what I do. How can I correct that? And so that even when you listen to me, you listen for your criticism, not just theirs. Then your participation in any, every scene will not be just as an audience, but will be an active learning one for each of us. There isn't a mistake that you make that I haven't made over and over and over again. And it is out of acknowledgment of those errors and trying to correct them that we all learn something and grow together. Almost no emotion goes steadily upwards and then explodes. That's only a dr dramatic cliche. It, it goes up and down. It can feel, in the middle of the deepest emotion sometimes, uh, you can be almost in shock so that you feel nothing. If you feel nothing, don't say, oh, that's wrong. I should be feeling something. Feel nothing. It, it let what, what moves in on you take you. And out of the nothingness, will, it might come, why don't do it? Another thing you did that, was, that got you in big trouble there was that you kept standing. Mm -hmm. Which, I'm sorry, which part? Uh, you told her, but you didn't tell me. Uh, you kept standing there. Yeah. And yeah. so your whole body, you know, with all these different... I, I, yeah. Don't. <laughs> do you mean sit or just do something? <laughs> Either one. Occupation is what gives us a presence on stage. And it doesn't have to be out or running around and doing the dishes and leaping into bed. What do I do when I seemingly have nothing to do? I'm waiting for a bus, or I'm waiting for a subway, or I'm waiting for somebody in a park. Somebody, I say, what were you doing there? I was waiting. I said, well, what were you doing while you were waiting? You know, what, what are you doing when you're confused? Not I'm doing nothing. I'm just acting confused, you see? If I say I'm waiting for a subway, or I'm waiting for somebody to meet me in a park, right? Now, nobody stands and waits for a subway, <laughs> right? Now, where's the subway coming from? What do you do while you're standing there? How do you make yourself comfortable in relationship to what you're wearing? Who do you see uh, when you plan what you're going to say to your agent? What do you do? Uh, uh, when you, you take another look, you wait for the train, you count the cracks, you start re rehearsing your audition, you do, but you don't stand and wait. <laughs> and you don't, uh, uh, in trauma, in, 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 a, in a big crisis, you may be confused, but what do you do in your state of confusion? That's what you have to find. Okay? That's very important. Uh, you have some zinger lines all the way through the play. Don't avoid a funny line and say, I don't want to show the audience that this is a joke. We spend three quarters of our lives trying to make people laugh. Yeah. Right? See if you can make her laugh. Then you have a justification for a comedic line. Right? We do that in life. Okay, good. It's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Set up barefoot in the park, please. In your rehearsals, work on place. I work an hour on place alone in terms of 
what do I usually do in that room? Where's my favorite place? What's it? If it's a new room to me, I ask my partner, what is in your room? What, what, what do we see outside of these windows? Where's your kitchen? Where's your John? Uh, 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 did your mother make these pillows? I don't know, I'm making this up. But I do all the, inve and not only do I talk about it, but I walk around in it, I touch things. And I sit and see what I would do in this room. And then put the scene on its feet and go moment to moment. Why do you come into the room? What do you see there? Where would you head? Uh, are you invited to sit down? Do you find your own place? Does she take your things? Do I take mine? And in that way, the scene evolves. Does anything occur to you that I might criticize? Arm movements. OK, all right, good. Yeah. Uh, uh, Melissa. Um, I find it really difficult to start the scene. So um, although I'm running my objective and my physical goal through my head and trying to internalize it in my body, I always feel a little unsteady okay. starting that. All right. Now, one of your biggest problems with the scene is that it has no real physical life anywhere. There is standing, there is preconceived line readings, and emotion. There is no physical presence in this room. Uh, let me show you something. I always say we never stand when we can sit. The standing here was continuously placed. If I get up and I'm going to get you a drink, and I head for the bar, right? And I go here, and I'm, I'm going to get you a drink. Now you say something to me. I can stand here for 10 minutes because when we're through with this, I'm going to go to tomorrow. That's what I mean by destination. We are always between places. If, if you stand over here, it's possible you're confronting him here. Now, your standing is dependent on whether you're going to go to bed, but you know in, internally, instinctively, you know that that's where you're going to end. Or you're going to change your mind and sit down here and have it out with him here. But you're, you never have destinations. That's when you, now you have to fight for relaxation. And your body is fighting to be relaxed. Okay. Okay. Now, when you both started, I knew you were both in trouble. Always connect your first beat with an activity, with a physical activity. Take a sock off and then start talking, and you'll be better off. Do you see what I mean? If I'm waiting for an entrance, uh, if, if it's no more than an adjustment of my belt just before I come in, I'm more in action than when I'm standing and trying to sift all the homework, and who am I, and who was my grandmother, and what am I doing here, and what's it? <laughs> and I say the three steps are, what did I just do? What am I doing now? What do I want? And go for it. Those are the three steps that will get you there. Not body exercises, not relaxation exercises, not workouts, uh, not inner work can get you in glue. You don't know which foot to start with, you know? So if the body isn't there, nothing else. We talk, we feel, we think, but it comes out of our body. So all the thinking and talking and feeling, if the body isn't there, it's useless. Do you see? Mm -hmm. The exercises and why I devised them. Years ago, when I worked a lot and played a lot, there were obviously times in between when I had nothing to do. There were many technical problems that nobody seemed able to solve for me, which arose, like suddenly panicking with an awareness of the audience of, uh, what do I do if I have to balance? Suddenly I'm hot and, and, and in a hurry and it's dark. And how do I incorporate all these conditioning forces into my work? So I began working at home by myself. And the first thing I learned was how little we are trained to observe ourselves, our behavior. We can always tell somebody how we feel about something, but what we did when we felt a certain way, we're unable to describe. So I started to watch myself at home in, in a variety of circumstances, and then see if I could bring into being and recreate just two minutes of a simple task while I was at home, understanding everything that was the cause of my behavior. The very first exercise, it's called destination. What is my physical destination? 
when you are spaceless, when you don't know where you are, what surrounds you, where you came from, and where you are heading, your body will tense, you will get very self-conscious, and start to arrange yourselves. If you know where you're going, where you came from, what surrounds you, and how that influences your behavior, you get free. Then all the wonderful work, psychological work you do on character and on, on the uh, movement of the scene can take place. Otherwise, it can't. I was playing with expectations, like when I would say something, what I'm hoping she's going to say. And in everyday life, you do have expectations with every moment, but some of them might be huge expectations. Oh, absolutely. Some of the, oh, of course. It's not a matter of degree, but there, we never know exactly what's going to come. We expect something, and sometimes we do get what, exactly what we expected, and then we're already on to the next. If I just say to you, uh, uh, how are you? Wonderful. Uh, I, uh, well, it wasn't quite what I expected, so it stopped me a little bit. <laughs> But I mean, you see, if I, if I say that to you, what I really want to say to you is, how long did you rehearse on this scene? I, and, it, and it's a jump in, right? Now, if I say, uh, how are you? And the actress is fine. I said, now, how long did you work on this scene? Now, if I say, how are you? And he says, I really have a terrible headache. I say, oh, oh I'm so Well, yeah, how long did you work on this scene? <laughs> But the, the uh, if I get what I expect, like I'm fine, then I'm already on to what I want to do. If I say, I'm going to work on, I'm hired to play, if I were a young man, to play the young man in uh, Bedtime Story by Sean O'Casey. And his first scene, he is, he's got a lost object. He's looking for a lipstick. It's pitch dark in the room. Uh, it is ice cold in the room. He has to be quiet because the landlady is downstairs. He has to, uh, uh, he spills, a, he knocks over a lamp and he's sopping wet and so forth and so on. There are like six conditioning forces at stake. I don't want to, at that point, learn how to stagger conditions and make them real to myself. I want to work on the character. Do you see what I mean? That's one of the glorious benefits of the object exercises, that we so... Uh, uh, build such reflexes in the reality of behavior that when we come to the park, we can now concentrate on the park. Jim. <laughs> okay. Now, you see, that was much better. Didn't it feel better? Yes, it did. You see, the, the test is, it was, in the first one, also some of the talking came was like, oh my god, it's gone, I'm never going to find it. So, which prevents a real search. Do you right. follow? Yeah. In other words, the possibility, it's got to be here, and the real hunt for it, and the, the talking yourself into the sureness that it must be in that first verse, and then if not where, it could be there. Oh no, it's got to be there. In other words, the, the whole thing of expectation in acting, that we expect something, and then we very rarely get exactly what we expect, is put to the ultimate test in this exercise. And you can apply, you saw her do it twice now, all the same activities. When it works, when it's really correct, you in the audience, her heart will start to pound. Who is she ever going to find it? Do you follow? You'll start to care. If it's mechanical, you'll sit and say, oh, she's looking for something. That's funny. Do you know? The, just the second time through was much, much better. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, inner objects? An inner object is something we contact visually in our mind's eye that is not present in the room. Memories, remember what you did yesterday when you told me such and such. Um, I, I'll show you one of my favorite demonstrations. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to the store. I have to button my coat, right? Now, I, I, I'm buttoning it up, and suddenly I say, why can't I concentrate? Everybody's looking at me. And I think, well, just button 
the coke. <laughs> and I'm, oh! Now I say, what, I, I, what am I getting at the grocery store? I, I need those baby peas. They're always out of those. I need a, uh, some bounty. I bet they only have Scott. And I go with my inner objects, and I button, and I don't even know I did it. Do you follow? By contacting my grocery store, the shelves, what they look like, I am then occupied, and I'm in line with going shopping. Um, I found that there were a couple of moments that I was just not there. And, it, and it's always the tough moments of the surprise when she says, I want a divorce. It felt, I don't know. You see, it starts earlier, actually. I want you out of here. Yeah. You see, and that, that didn't land at all. Your pants were more important than what that meant. Yes. By the way, that's what I want to talk about, that some of your activities, when the activities stay pieces of business, you're using them wrong. In other words, when, when uh, uh, you see, if, if I'm hanging up pants, I'm hanging them over this thing. Now, when this, that they're right, becomes more important than what I'm hearing here, this is not serving you. Doesn't mean that I don't do this, but you see, if I'm doing this and she says, say to me, I, I, I want you to be out of here. Okay, now wait. I want you out of this apartment. What do you mean, out of here? We certainly don't think that, that we're gonna live here together, do you, after tonight? Whatever, but then I go on with this. But I don't have to finish my piece of business. Do you follow? Yes, yes. How substitution in relationship to others can change. Let's suppose uh, my sense of age, how young or how old I am, very often depends on whom I'm with, right? Now, I'm walking down the hall, and I bump into Alfred Lunt, and he reaches out and asks to shake my hand. Now, I'm heading here, and I see it's Alfred Lund. You know? <laughs> I mean, I'm 18 again. That's the, how I feel. I mean, because the, of the admiration about our relationship at that time. Now, I can substitute, if we're playing together, him for you, if I need to. Do you see? Right. And it brings about a totally different. Now, the, the whole point in substitution is that I'm not carrying as we shake hands, I'm not carrying Alfred Lund around in my head. I'm not playing, you know, where is he? And that's what he looks like, and you know. But I'm, I'm transferring that relationship onto you. And when I shake hands with you, I'm doing it to you, right? Not to him anymore. That's where we often screw up in, in substitutions. We hang on to the source. And it floats around with us. We're doing homework there, and we don't see who we're doing it with. See, when it's translated into action, into behavior with the partner, our relationship immediately becomes something else. Now, if I take my snotty son-in-law, the same circumstances, all right? And you offer me your hand. OK, here I go. And I go. You see, now. <laughs> but I've done it. I've, again, done it to him, not to my son-in-law. You see, that's the, the step in rehearsal we often leave out, that we imagine, and then we hang on to the imaginative thing rather than putting it on to the object or the person. Uh, I had a real problem with the physicality. Um, and I, I think, given more time, what I would like to you talk also about setting physicality and yet having it be newly alive. And that's what I still feel we need to achieve. OK. Any physical confrontation on stage has to be worked out like a ballet so that it can be spontaneous. In other words, just slugging or just if it gets dangerous or out of control, first of all, the audience senses that they immediately lose reality and say, oh, that actor is hurting that actor, not Petruccio is attacking Kate. Do you see? In other words, this is an aspect of the whole chapter I have on endowment, endowing something with a reality that it doesn't have through physical actions. And in other words, if I have to, if I have to have boiling hot coffee and burn myself, I want nice cool tea or whatever it is on stage, and then I endow it with what it should be, right? 
the, uh, the same in the fight. I don't want anything that's going to take control of me or take the scene where it shouldn't go. So, uh, but I want to work on it so that it has sensory reality to me and then bring it about so that I can believe it and then the audience will believe it. One, the sensory responses to visible and tangible objects that have been imaginatively endowed with properties that cannot or should not be real on stage. For instance, I don't want a real hot iron on stage. I might burn myself. Uh, I don't want real steam to come out of an iron on stage. I always tell the story about Mary Ewer, who was ironing in, in Look Back in Anger on Broadway here. And when the steam came out of the iron, first of all, the entire audience said, oh, look, real steam. That's that plugged in. And they left the, the stage. They, they had no reality anymore at all, because suddenly it was real steam. Secondly, she, one night, the steam, she got a steam burn, curtain, she was rushed to the hospital, and the performance was canceled. So the, those dangerous realities that can control you have to be found not by the reality, but by an endowed reality. the exercises should ideally set up an automatic rehearsal process so that you rehearse all day long. You don't just rehearse when you set the time for it. I can't, uh, I, I can't go to an oven. Every time I open my oven at home, I see how I go back from the heat. Do you follow? In other words, it, uh, the self-observation involved when you burn yourself when you touch an iron, at which point you pull back the finger. The, because these are the things that create the reality of the sensation. Can you see from this exercise the endless variations? Opening a bottle that's supposed to be stuck. A sharp knife. I use a dull one and see what happens when it's supposed to be really sharp. So I can't hurt myself. OK, I think that's enough. It's very good. Now, the second part of this exercise is where you endow physical sensations through the circumstances. In other words, weather, heat, cold, having to be quiet, being in a hurry. In other words, you're endowing the circumstances with realities which they don't quite have. The, uh, certain, the balance wasn't as strong as it was in the No, I didn't think so either. By the way, drunkenness is probably the hardest condition in the world to play without indicating and without uh, uh, illustrating. Uh, and uh, you, you were on the, sometimes it was wonderful, but it wasn't, uh, I don't think it was consistent. I don't know why. The thing is to localize one area, and each, each person, if you've ever been tight or, or, uh, or almost drunk at all, uh, it's the hardest one also because when we're drunk, we don't know what we're doing. So uh, it's hard to be self-observant while you're plastered. The, uh, but if you go for one area of your body that is out of control, as one of the most suggestible to me when I'm standing, is my knees. And to allow them, uh, in other words, to, to give in to the desire, uh, to, the, to the fact that they feel wobbly. In other words, to give in to them, but then try to control it. Do you follow? You don't want to be, in other words, what most actors do, or most uh, people who play drunks, is that they want to be out of control, you see. Now, if, if, if your knees, if you're trying to get ahead and your knees go, you want to straighten up. Then your head, then your head starts to carry you back, right? So, but you want the head to be straight. So there's continuously finding the vulnerability and overcoming it with a desire to do it correctly. Right. right? Now, again, yeah. staying drunk is harder sitting. When you sit, it's usually your head that wants to go, that you try to keep straight, you know, and then the attempt for, for normals. I didn't even do that on purpose, you see. Uh, and the attempt to, to get, uh, and to focus, you see, to get to the right place for this, make sure that that's your cigarette, you know. So that the, the, uh, the attempt is for normalcy. 
Yes. I've read your um, book in the section on transference several, several times, and um, like I've really worked on it, but I'm never clear if like I'm doing it like right, you know. If you won't be doing right until you start with your body. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and where okay. it is and what it's doing there. Then we can start feeling. Okay. It's in the doings that you believe in. Not sitting thinking heat or thinking glare or thinking these things, but what do I do to overcome it? And in the moment of finding the action, you have the sensation. To bring about the things that the scenic designer can't give you. That's the purpose of this exercise. We feel fully occupied if we know where we are, what we're doing there, what we're wearing, where, we, where we're going, where we came from. And when I say what we're wearing, how the clothing influences how you stand. If you had on shoes that were too tight or a, um, an evening jacket or an evening shirt, you would, uh, if we're going someplace fancy, you would behave quite differently. Isn't that true? Sure. And those are the considerations why this is a little bit easier to do here in this exercise than it is on stage, is that when we're on stage in a problem like this, we are wearing a costume instead of our own clothes. We haven't endowed them with the reality so that they belong to us. We very often are spare on inner objects that come from the given circumstances, which are different for, for the character in the play than they would be for you. Oh, let me see you walk. <laughs> Go fool and who now keeps coming. Did ever Diane so become a girl as Kate? This chamber with her princely gait. Be uh, thou, Diane. Let her be Kate. And then let Kate be chased in Diane's sportful. Where did you study all this goodly speech? <laughs> it is extempore from my mother with. Uh, a witty mother. Willis Elser's son. <laughs> okay. Now, how did you feel today? Better. A lot oh yeah, we heard you. You know now what the words mean. They don't always land, but uh, that we're going to talk about. That's the next step. But you really made big progress in the scene. Isn't it funny how then you suddenly understand the scene? It suddenly makes sense if you really talk to each other. Now, how did you feel? I feel like I'm being demonstrative in the scene, and I keep going in my head about not wanting to do that as an actor. Do you know what I mean? If you do it for her, right. it's correct. Right. If you do it for right. us, right. it's bad acting. Right. Do you follow? Right. Now, the expectations. You aren't new enough to each other. You already know each other too well. When you send the action, what is the consequence? How did it land? That will lead you to the next. Right. And sometimes you drop in between. When, once you've taken the scene apart and understand it this well, don't do homework about receiving it. Receive it and go to follow it. It will be more tightly linked without rushing it. Right. The selection of activities is like day and night now, isn't it? I just thought you learned so many things from this scene that I'm just thrilled. Oh, you should be too. Yeah. Thank you. And you see that we can talk like this, right? right? Yeah. I have a Shakespeare class. What's interesting is that in the beginning, the idiom is so strange to us, and it's really almost like talking a foreign language. Uh, when you get used to it, uh, instead of saying, where are you going? If I uh, say often enough, whither are going, it's as, as real to me as the other. Do you see? Talking to yourself is involuntary. Very often we don't know it. I talk to myself a lot. It took me years to realize it. People walk in and say, who are you talking to? You know? <laughs> now, the... I don't talk to myself when I am physically still. That's why you're having trouble. You see, oh, that's the only reason you're having trouble. You have to have an activity. And, you have to, and it doesn't have to be completed, and it doesn't have to get all the way finished. Right. You see, what you're missing is the vanity. Now, when we have a crush on someone, which you do have on Astro, big one, uh, we become very self-aware of our bodies, of everything. Now, in what you might choose, I go to the most obvious, you, I hope you'll reject that, which is to fix your face, or fix your hair, or put a drop of perfume on your kerchief. Or I give myself 
10 things I could do, and I try them all, always remembering that the purpose uh, is not to finish the activity, but to know what it, what it, what it would be. What it would be. In any monologue, by the way, I always say, what would I do here if I didn't talk? And I explore all of that, and then at some point it's going to be very easy to start talking. Right. Okay? Now, um, the sensory life, you see, see, here you stood, he was there, neither of you were physically aware of each other. Right? Did she have on scented soap? You see her hair here? Do you see her hands? She's listening to you, she's looking at the papers, she's going, and you're showing her your work. Now, you see, when you hear him talk, this, you try to listen to this, the tone of his voice, his soap, his leather jacket. I mean, this is so loaded, do you see, with sensuality. I know, I thought that what I was trying to do in the scene was to steel myself against that. So I, I know, but this is your biggest problem as an actress. You find a mask and you stick to the mask. You forget what's underneath. Never mind these masks. Uh, take them off. And if it's inadequate for the character, I'll tell you. But uh, don't, uh, don't play the cover so successful. You end up succeeding in the cover. You lose what's, what's cooking. Right? The two biggest issues of this, are the primary one being my relationship with Yelena. The secondary, this map that I've come to show. And I have always had this trouble, of, and I call it spinning, where it's almost like I run up against it and I come back, and I run up against it and I come back, and I run up against it, and I never go through it. I never can find a way of connecting myself to that relationship or to that objective or to that meaning. And it and, is uh, terribly hard. I tell you what, what I think it is. I'm not sure, but I think so. You've made a beautiful map, by the way. I always go crazy with what the actor brings in as a map. The last, one, the last one I picked up and I said, was that an empty page? And he, I went and he said, yeah. And you knew that it was an empty page. So that map is crucial. What is missing is that you're not passionate enough about it. You, this is truly the most meaningful thing in your life, is that pursuit of the ecology, which nobody understands. A hundred years ago, Chekhov was concerned with something that is bugging us now. It's fantastic. Now, you see, if you say link it, the opportunity to share that with a person you have got the hots for in no mean terms, right, is so exciting that it's just fantastic. Where can I go to make that map more important? I'm trying to find issues. Take something that you really feel passionate about and now transfer it to that map. Okay? The reason we talk aloud to ourselves is always to gain control over circumstances. And the circumstances can be boredom. I can start playing fancy games with myself because what I'm doing is so tedious. In a big dramatic monologue, it's that you are in crisis and need the words to help yourself find answers. Many, many people say, no, I don't talk to myself. Of course, it's not true. I had an auditor in a class who, while I was teaching this exercise, marched up front, turned to the class and me, and said, nobody talks to themselves unless they're crazy. So I said, please, uh, you're an auditor. That means, listen, don't talk, and then go and sit down. <laughs> so I didn't see this, but I was told afterwards by my key student and people sitting in the back that he was furious. He sat down and for the rest of the class said, Absolutely. <laughs> and talked to the end of the class, but he never talks to himself. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to take a drink. I, I didn't even want one. Okay. When you worked on the material, what was hard for you, the hardest for you? William? I think most difficult for me was making clear which issue was most vital to me. So I guess 
I was still working on and trying to figure out what to think about. Okay. And Cynthia, what was hardest for you? Um, the hardest thing was trying to find like the transitions because it start when we were doing it, it would like be all at one level, and then it would be here, here, and so like to find where it kind of where it went to, and just staying like just staying in the moments rather than kind of like cause it, it got very general. We were rehearsing it, even though I was being I thought I was being specific in my homework. It didn't. It was hard bringing it to the scene. Now, when you read it, how what would you classify this play? How would you classify this play? What kind of play is it? If I had to label it, um, I would say it was a drama. And you? Yeah, a family drama. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a comedy. It's a comedy. Uh, now, you see, if it's a drama, it is such an ugly play that I don't know why anybody would want to do it or see it. Well, maybe that was the problem. I think that's the problem. That's what I'm getting at. You see, oh I think God. you have to find, to make the play tolerable and find variations, because it's, each scene is the same throughout the whole play. Yeah. Now, how can you sustain that if it is really that ugly? Now, I'm not a director, and I don't know the play intimately so that I know I'm right, but I think I'm right. So to explore it, see what happens. In something like a fight, if two people love each other, a fight can be hilarious. And I got into a fight with my husband that uh, while it was going on, I knew it was ludicrous. It was so funny, but I didn't stop doing what I was doing. You see? Now, what is the fun in fighting, if there is such a thing? Is the enjoyment of one-upmanship. Do you see? Now, I think if you look for that, you're going to find so many variations in this. What have you used before as a weapon? When does it work? When does it fail? When are you hit by it? So you need to find a, 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 another one to top him with or to best him with. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. The crying. When do you know that the crying is going to undo him? How right. good can you do it for him? Do you see? Right. I have a wonderful recording, I'm so blessed, of a Dick Cavett uh, interview with Noel Coward on his 70th birthday and the Lunts. And it's a masterpiece, it really is. And there's one point where they, they were talking about, the Lunts were talking about how they worked with each other and the problems, and, 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 and Mr. Lunt said, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was so strange, I kept saying to Linny in this play, the line where I asked for the cup of tea, it's so funny in that circumstance. And I, and I said to her, <clears throat> why can't I get a laugh there? And she said, you don't know? And he said, no. She said, because you're asking for a laugh instead of for a cup of tea. Uh, you see? <laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> oh, terrific. <laughs> I didn't even want one. <laughs> Why you do this to me? <laughs> Goddamn thing. <laughs> I think we should separate. No, we are not going to separate. Why can't I can't take this anymore. I just want to. I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a ball? Did you enjoy that now? Oh, just wonderful. Just wonderful. I have a peculiar feeling that working on it the other way in a strange way served you for when you let it go. I'm not recommending that you should start wrong in order to get it right. <laughs> but in this, in this instance, I really think it had something to do because it was so full. I have, I have no criticism. I mean, a few little tiny things that are what? not worth talking about. <laughs> I just thought it was a field day, a real give and take, and going with it, it was a delicious. Can I just follow you around? <laughs> Questions? Yes? Why do you say to, to cross out the stage directions? 
when I say very emphatically when you read the play, cross out the stage directions, what I really mean is all adjectives. In other words, happily, gladly, sadly, like a moth. I, I never could play. I never. I never could play that opening beat of Streetcar because it's just like a moth banging against the light bulb, you know. And I had this image, of, you know. I thought, oh God, leave me alone. Eugene O'Neill's descriptions, his novels he writes before before you come on, block me tremendously. Yes. What should you discuss with your scene partner? Definitely discuss what your objectives are and make sure they're in conflict. Because I can say my objective is to get you out of here, and the other one says my objective is to get out. Well, you've got nothing to play. <laughs> right? So make sure that they're in, in conflict. Do not discuss the actions. Don't say, I, oh, I'm going to do such and such. Then you become an audience and say, he's not doing what he just said he was going to do. In other words, and you won't be surprised by them. So never discuss the actions. You can talk about the relationship of what you've done together, previous circumstances, improvise how you deal with each other in a normal day, but don't discuss the psychological life of the scene too much. Get up and do it. I'll tell you a funny story. I played once uh, a streetcar with Marlon Brando without any rehearsal to standing room only audience because uh, uh, he was already then totally undisciplined and had taken a uh, two weeks vacation and during which I played with Tony Quinn and then he was supposed to come back from his vacation we were going to rehearse and then we were going to play. So he arrived five minutes after half hour was called. This, the producer said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I said. Uh, and I said to Marlon, you want to try five minutes and see what happens? He said, <laughs> he said I'm game. And I said, OK. And we rehearsed about five minutes. And I thought, oh, I think this will, might work. He had never seen me. I had never seen him. We really had totally, I had a totally different interpretation than Jessica. And he had a totally different layout than, than, than Quinn. It worked like a charm. I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, it was rather. Uh, uh, unnerving. But, and why it worked was that we had both rehearsed and played a lot in that set with those objects. We never lost circumstances. I, I'm very attuned to my partner, no matter if I've played with him a long time or a little time, I will be tuned in. And it, it worked. Now, that can only work if circumstances, relationship, place, every tiny object is familiar to me. Yes. What do you do when a mistake or an accident happens on stage during a performance? If a true accident happens, if it is plausible within the circumstances, deal with it. So and, uh, but if you, you see, if, if it looked like a mistake, then the actor was saying, oh, I'm sorry, and saying, I've got to get over a mistake, rather than saying, oh, my God, I'm sorry. Did I do that? Let me get something and mop him up. And nobody will know it was a mistake. They'll think it was in there on purpose. OK? So what you can't cover is when the scenery falls down. <laughs> I, I have another. I also think, you see, if you're playing mechanically or playing posing, any mistake will look terrible. I'll never forget a classical actress who shall remain nameless uh, in, in a Grecian toga, uh, walking from here to there and walking, and she tripped <laughs> um, If she had been walking, and she, she tripped over her dress, it would have been nothing. But because it didn't fit the mold, uh, it looked ludicrous. <laughs> now, the purpose of this exercise, which follows talking to yourself, is to discover all the problems that occur when we have to talk to the audience. I played a lot of plays like that, and it was always unbelievably difficult for me if I left the circumstances in which the play took place. Let's assume it's the Brecht. Uh, 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 there are many monologues for uh, the character, Shente, whom I played, where she talks to the audience about what she's doing. 
And if I went from 18th century China to a contemporary audience at the Phoenix Theater where I played it, there were two such totally different realities that I could never recover. So I created for myself imaginary people that were from the little village in China where I lived, who were passers-by, who were observing what I'd been doing so that I, I didn't lose my character or my time and place by looking at the audience here. Direct eye contact with people who sit in the auditorium. Anybody who tells you you should make eye contact with them is crazy. And I say to prove the point to yourself, remember the times when you have sat in an audience and a performer has looked right at you. You immediately get very self-conscious. Women always start adjusting their brassiere straps. You know, <laughs> She's looking at me. What is expected of me? What does she want? Now, that can't help the actor if he sees he's made somebody very uncomfortable. So in order not to make eye contact, I take my imaginary people and place them in the audience, either directly over their heads or in aisles, and I now address them. Everybody here thinks I'm talking to them. You will feel included, more included, than if you actually make eye contact. You know, if, if there's a spill of light here uh, from the stage that makes these eyes visible, and those are just bodies, that's fine. You can look at bodies, but they won't feel attacked, and you won't feel that they interfere with your reality. So now, how do I talk to somebody like that? So I've given the actor in this the problem of placing somebody in their own space, imaginarily here, and telling them something to see how this can work. Now, what's interesting is that you just where you got up and got the plate, I was going to say, you don't have to stay there. Right. So you follow through on an impulse that was absolutely correct. But if the task becomes so primary. Right. I felt that as I, as I began. That's what I, I, I wondered especially if you with the were silver going to. This is too primary. Yeah, yeah. Back off. But um, <laughs> no, what is so important, what I continue, continue, continue to find strength in, no matter what I'm working on, is that sense of place. Absolutely. And the more you know where the hell you are, absolutely, make you're grounded. Absolutely. Then you can add other things. But if you don't have that, there's nothing. Nothing. Matter concerns my stepdaughter Sonia. Yes. How do you feel about her? I respect her. And your feelings towards her as a woman? My feelings toward her as a woman. Yes. I have none. Okay. Now, how did you feel today? Sometimes I just get so... I want to do it all so much that, that I lose my grounding. It, it's, it's like it just all comes up at once. You know, you can't get... To... You know what's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it. Because it's, it's true for many of us. You aren't functioning. As an actress, you're an actress, you're a born actress, you should be on stage all the time, and you're not. And then, the pent up, the, the, I'm going to start crying. It's devastating that we get a chance and that it isn't complete and it isn't really going the whole way. It's agony. That's why we have to make our own theaters. Right? That's what's torturing you, nothing else but. And if once you know what it is, I mean, then it'll help a little bit. Okay. What can you tell me? I'm so frustrated because I, I try to find something from my life that, that has such meaning to me that I, I need to express it to somebody. Why were you crying just Her. now? No. That's I what. That's that the, the meaning. That started, I that's the that meaning. Put into this mat. It, yeah. But exactly, and exactly. I, and I keep feeling like um, if I bring this feeling from something else into this, I keep wanting to go just with the given circumstances. But you see, when you find though, me, when you find the, your substitution, and then now you truly transfer it to the map, and these become synonymous. That takes a while. 
what I use for certain things, and there, this one I can talk about because it, it's long gone, but something that I used at a certain section, a, a trigger moment in Virginia Woolf, I used something, and I don't know why it was me, why it triggered the whole experience in me, it was some kind of the, the ivy crawled, a piece of ivy crawling up a stucco wall and asking where I once lived. And that leaf, well, eventually, if I think of that leaf now, it comes from Virginia Woolf, not from Maasning anymore. It becomes synonymous. And when you're not accustomed to ma making transferences and always making sure they have a consequence in the action, that's what anchors them to you. You see, when they, are by, when they stay by themselves and don't get truly transferred, they're very iffy. Give me an example of the consequence in the action. Uh, what, what is the vine leaf the emotion that is triggered by the vine leaf, what does that make you do about it? And the doing is to somebody or something on stage. And what is the nature of that action? And if, if it isn't, doesn't lead you to a defined action, it's ephemeral. It hangs there by itself like a little emotional object. So what? I worked on the cherry orchard for about 10 years. I worked on it in English first, then I did it in Russian, then I finally got to do it in a dreary production. The closing performance, I found out how to say goodbye to the cherry orchard. The closing night, and I didn't have another chance to do it again, you know? So th that's the terrible thing with Chekhov. We can't be impatient in it. We can't score it like a storyline. This I'll play here, and I'll play that there, and I'll play that there. I have to have all the sources. That's why I say three quarters of Chekhov is homework. And then doing it and doing it and leaving it free and leaving it limber each time something else will happen. If something is inevitably correct, you'll probably stick to it. But if you stick to it for its effect, it'll be dead. Right? It's, it's, it's an in, in bottomless hunt for this. So. You see, sometimes you are impatient with yourselves and you want it all to be there at once. It can't be. It's impossible. That I just thought you found out 20 new... Th Didn't the monologue work better? Now, what about that? That in itself, you've learned a ton. I, I really, with Dawson, I thought, I'll never find anything in this room. It's a Victorian drawing room. What's in here? And then I found all these things that I, I do. That was fascinating. But you see, the doing is what releases the, the, the inner life and releases the images and makes you need to talk. Otherwise, you stand and you don't even know. What, I mean, the years I stood with monologues and thought, how can I start talking? Not sneaking in. No, not starting that way, but starting. You know? I just thought you, you made enormous progress. So you should be very excited. Okay? Good. One of the most important things, by the way, in most plays is um, underwear. Now, you know, when you say, uh, oh, those Victorians were so, so, such prim and proper people, you know, they always sat so straight. Well, they were wearing corsets. And it's very hard if you have stiff stayed corsets coming up and holding you up to do this. You can't. So again, it's not a matter of playing style, because that's how they were, but find what it came from. If they say, oh, you shouldn't cross your legs, I say, for the purpose of the exercise, do what they did. They wore two petticoats. I defy you to try to cross your legs. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> then you won't cross your legs. You will sit because of, not because it's stylistically correct. If your sleeve, instead of being a latex uh, uh, sleeve that bends very easily and it's very tight, and it's so, you'll find that you can't bend your elbow. Do you see? You can only bend it so far. And that if you pour, if you have a beautiful, in an Oscar Wilde play or something, everybody's always, you know, playing style. Uh, if, if you have a long ruche hanging here that it took your housekeeper an half an hour to press properly, you won't want to dunk it in the tea. You will make sure that it's up. If, if it's good manners not to get a lot of fingerprints on the, on the silver teapot, you will pour in order not to get the fingerprints on. Then you will find the behavior. Uh, 
And of course, I, I know that nothing has changed in the human psyche except fashion and social mores. But we always got mad. We always fell in love. We always were possessive. We were always slightly neurotic. You know, all the things that we think are only us today have always been true for the human being. And to see if I can put my character into a time and place so that I believe I lived there then. That is really the purpose of that exercise. Mar, we walked into another time and place. From the moment you walked in. Now, did you have any questions? Well, I, I just, I can tell you love the character. I do. Yeah, I can tell. And now, what is so successful, first of all? The trouble with some of the objects which are difficult is that we run out of inner objects under non-crisis circumstances to keep our attention going while we get dressed. Button buttons, lace shoes. Put a, see, that was your bustle. I mean, it was just... I, I oh. put it on very tight today. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to... And then the, the tightness in relationship to the shoes. No, it was wonderful. The... Uh, uh, what you gain from this exercise and how to work on it, this was an example. You won't see it much better than that. And now if she played this character, three quarters of the work on the Who Am I and her faith in historic time and place has been conquered. It's just wonderful. And it never is a costume. You see, that's the, the dangerous thing. She's not putting on a costume. She's putting on her clothes. She's washing her face, not somebody else's. She is uh, uh, hanging up that particular blouse for tomorrow. I mean, everything. Just wonderful. Every single object you selected in terms of a different time and place and making that habit rather than something strange. Or they did, they would, they would light a, a, a lamp like that, they would light their candle. Like, it was you doing it as though it were your candle, your room, and your habit. It's just wonderful. I think we should have, at this point, a question and answer period on where we are. OK? I'll get up there, and you formulate your questions. All right, yes. When you have a scene partner that um, wants you to do something that you feel is illogical, how do you deal with that when you don't have a director? Even when the director is there. If an actor gets illogical, go with him. And the illogic, and then it suddenly doesn't fit the dialogue, and then they stop. Let's say an example that I make, which is very visual, so you'll know. If the actor goes out too soon, he has to make an exit, and I have to say, uh, "Come on, why, why are you leaving?" And he's gone already. I don't say you're leaving too soon, because then he just gets mad at me and thinks I'm directing him. So I let him go. Then I don't say my line. He comes back and says, you didn't say your line. I said, you were gone. <laughs> and then there's no discussion anymore. Yeah. You know, another thing we were just discussing about physical violence on stage, when I was in Streetcar with Tony Quinn, he knocked me black and blue. I mean, he really, and every performance I'd say, Tony, please, I put more makeup on my body than on my face because I'm bruised from head to toe. Well, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I felt it. You know? 
So this went on for weeks. And one day I was sitting on the desk, and he has to come toward me and shake me. And I saw, saw him come towards me. The thumbs were already out. I knew which muscle they were going to land in, you know. <laughs> and they, sure enough, they did, and they landed. And I went, oh, 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 oh. And he stopped. And he forgot all his lines. And he went, well, oh, oh. And uh, I, funny, I got him back into the dialogue. And we came off stage. He said, you're not supposed to say that there. I said, I felt it. <laughs> he never hurt me again. <laughs> uh, fundamentals of how you, when you work on a part and score your uh, piece of it, do you um, blow it up onto a big sheet of paper and work from there, or do you write your own lines? How do you, do you see, that is totally personal. Wow. It's whatever is stimulating to you. I have on some things thick workbooks, on others a few pages. I make little personal notes about substitutions and transferences that I make. For instance, Virginia Woolf, Martha, who is the daughter of the university president, very strong academic background in terms of her, her life, faculty parties and so on. Well, my father was a professor. I uh, was raised in a, in a faculty uh, atmosphere, in an academic atmosphere, so that in to substantiate those realities was so, I mean, I just made it direct. It matched. She adored her father, so did I. You know, so that much of it was done. If I go to St. Joan, I'm in a big, I got a big problem. I got a lot of work to do. Do you see? OK. Yes? When is too much too much, or it's never too much? Like Nothing is too much if it has reality. What is too much is pushing, mugging, illustrating, indicating is too much, is wrong. But a full experience, no matter how huge it can be, is not too much, in my opinion. Yes? Because we do a lot of film and television, um, we're faced with the fact that our destination is a mark on the floor. I mean, how do I take that and apply it? The mark on the floor is still either near a table, near a chair. It's not spaceless. So the principle is identical. Why do I go to that table? Then you'll hit your mark more easily, too. OK. Why do I go over there? Right. And that's your own, your, your own. I mean, most directors don't give you justification. You've got to find your own anyway. Right, right. In, on stage, too. <laughs> OK. Yes. Could you tell the opera story, the one about true intention? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what I always say, if on stage, a true intention, it's like a chorus line. It's the, the, all the chorus girls are lined up. And one of them takes a peek at the audience to see if her agent is there. You know, It's like being shot by a bullet. Now, everybody is singing and going, and this one person goes, <laughs> And everybody jumps, you know. So uh, the story, Herbert and I went to a dress rehearsal of Lone Green, God help us, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I kept saying, I don't want to go 10 o'clock in the morning to a three-hour opera. I just can't bear it. Herbert said, come on, it'll be interesting. So we went. And on stage, as the curtain went up, there were rocks and levels, and later on, swans going by, and I don't know what all. And people in with singers with horns and the, the furs and then long robes and everything. And there on one of these rocks were tons of extras. And right in front was an extra who had obviously never been on stage in his life and didn't know what he was doing there. So while they're singing and going and carrying on, he had on one of these uh, armor hats, and he had the, uh, the knitted uh, chainmail gloves, you know. <laughs> Wait a minute. And the curtain went up. <laughs> he looked, there were a half a dozen people, and the director and the, the, Mr. Bing, the head of the Met. Then somebody here sang very loudly, and he went. <laughs> he started looking at the scenery. He started looking at the other. 
And then, then after he had a lot of looks like this, and we were weeping. <laughs> he got bored with all that stuff that was going on around. And he began to. <laughs> and then his hat started to bother him. And finally, the hat couldn't bear it anymore. <laughs> well, anyhow, an hour and a half. It was an experience not to be forgotten. When I go to the theater, if I can see the acting, I already don't like it. In other words, if it's the performer and his mind and his speculations and what he fixes and arranges is visible to me, it's bad acting, in my opinion. When I believe that there's a human being in action up there, in that moment, alive, right there and then, I get spellbound. Stay innocent, stay curious to the day you die. Don't know the answer. Try to figure out, you know, and try to understand. And you see, that which makes us unique and which allows you to imagine that you live in another time, in another place, in another room, that you really believe that is based on innocence. That's why we act so wonderfully when we're children, because we really believe. And that ability to believe we should keep to the day we die and don't let anybody take it away from you. Certainly don't take it away from yourself. Mm -hmm.